Okay, good morning, members. I'm gonna call Human Services Finance and Policy to order. Lindsay, can you please take the roll? Of course, good morning, members. Chair Schultz. Present. Vice Chair Bonner. I know she's here. <laughs> Lead Albright. Present. Thank you. Representative Bolden. Present. Representative Burkle. Present. Representative Fisher. Fisher, present. Good morning. Representative Frederick. Present. Representative Hansen. Present. Representative Keel. Representative Liebling. Present. Thank you. Representative Moeller. Present. Representative Noor. Present. Representative Novotny. Representative Pearson. Pearson, present. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, present. Thank you. Representative Robbins. Present. Representative Sandell. Present. And Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, present. Thank you, members. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. We do have a quorum. Okay, members, today we have um, bills on our agenda. Some of them we've heard, and some, so we'll just uh, pass those to the general register um, or to Ways and Means. Um, we have two new bills on our agenda today. Um, we have a lot to get through, so I'm going to limit uh, members to one question um, and one follow up, and we can always circle back if we have more time. Um, if members have questions um, for testifiers or for the bill author. And also note that we are going to be um, reconvening for an informational hearing with the Health Finance Committee at 3 o'clock today to review the American Recovery Act um, and the implications for the state of Minnesota with the federal funds, and we'll get information from our agencies on the guidelines for spending those federal dollars in Minnesota particularly in health and human services. So let's see, Chair Fisher, would you like to move the minutes from March 25th? Chair Schultz, I'd like, I've reviewed the minutes from March 25th, 2021, and I'd like move their approval, please. Thank you, Chair Fisher moves the minutes from March 25th, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving, approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the minutes are approved. The first bill we have for consideration is House File 41. So I'll move to re-refer House File 41 to Ways and Means. Representative Frazier, welcome back to our committee. And I know this bill has been through many committees. And so, and it looks like you have an A5 amendment. So I'll move the A5 amendment. Can you briefly describe it? Yeah, this is an amendment that allows for, um, it, it's about the way that nursing homes are reimbursed. Uh, we didn't have this language accurately stated in the bill, so it shapes things up so that the nursing homes can adequately be reimbursed when they have to tap into these emergency leave funds. Okay, all those in favor of adopting the A5 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails in the A5 amendment to House File 41. Is adopted. So, Representative Frazier, to your bill as amended. Thank you, uh, Chair Schultz. You know, so, I, I, I think most people have heard this bill. It's been through almost every committee so far. Uh, so, I won't be. I won't take too long. And I think we may have a couple of testifiers. There were a couple that submitted documents as well for a testimony. Um, this is it's an emergency leave bill for essential workers. Um, back in March of last year, the the federal Congress passed a bill that provided for emergency leave for COVID related issues for essential workers. However, there were some essential workers that were um, that were exempt from that and they were left out. This bill seeks to close that gap and capture those folks that were left out. Essentially what it will do is it will provide them with, um, for the first period, 80 hours of, uh, of, of, of leave time paid um, with their, whatever their salary rates or hourly rates were. Um, so they don't lose out on pay if they have to take leave for COVID related reasons, or if they had to, it's retroactive. If they had to take leave during that period of time, that they were not covered, it will replenish um, those accounts for them for the leave that they for the uh, PTO or vacation or sick time that they had to expend during that time. And then moving forward, because the, the American Rescue Plan continues this program, it would also allow them to be eligible for another 80 hours uh, during this time 
um, with, an ex with a set expiration date in September, um, unless there's still emergency powers in place and it would go 30 days past that, just to make sure that anybody that um, would need to can access um, the regulatory process for that if they have to. Um, what this bill does not do, it does not give folks um, an extra pot of, uh, of lead time that they just have access to. It has to be for COVID related reasons. I, I wanna make that clear. And for organ for companies or businesses that have already um, provided these this, these type of lead provisions, you do not have to provide on provide extra. You just only have to meet up to what this bill provides. So if you've already provided 80 hours, then you've already provided 80 hours of lead time uh, for these individuals if you've already done that. You don't have to provide on top of that if you had a program in place that was similar to FFCRA um, or the American Rescue Plan as in place now. Um, with that said, this is really just focused on our essential workers. They've already paid the cost for this. We talk a lot about what it's gonna to cost to do this. They've paid the cost by working day in and day out, putting themselves in harm's way to make sure that businesses can businesses could continue to run and provide services for their customers. Those businesses would not be open without those workers. Um, some of those businesses business have done very well. Um, so the, the cost for this has already been paid by those workers. We just need to center it on that. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, I will take any questions. I believe we have a testifier with us. We have Jessica Joyal. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and proceed with your testimony. Is Ms. Joyal with us? I'm not seeing her. Okay, we'll move to questions. Questions from members for the bill author. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question for the author of the bill. And then a question for you, Madam Chair. And the question to the author of the bill is, uh, Representative uh, Frazier, in the definition that you uh, put forth in your bill uh, as an essential worker, it, it describes uh, and enumerates the number and the, the, de the uh, employee descriptions for a number of uh, providers. And my presumption is that this is not only for uh, private enterprise, but for public enterprise as well. Would that be correct? That is, that is correct. Frazier? Sorry, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Albright, thank you for the question. That is correct. Representative Albright. Madam Chair, thank you for that, uh, uh, Representative Frazier. My question then uh, to uh, the, the chair of this committee, uh, Madam Chair is, Will your bill, I understand there's a preliminary fiscal note that uh, has been uh, uh, delivered. We're waiting on the final, but uh, Madam Chair, I'm wondering if your, your omnibus bill then is going to carry the cost uh, for providing those uh, benefits to those essential workers uh, that would be uh, working at say St. Peter, Anoka Regional Treatment, uh, the 16 bed community behavioral health hospitals, nursing homes, uh, the DNR, uh, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Transportation, as well as any other uh, state government entity where an essential worker has been uh, identified and deemed worthy of these benefits. For your omnibus bill, would, will you be carrying the cost uh, for those essential workers under these provisions? So thank you for the question, Representative Albright. So I will be waiting to see the fiscal note to see what those costs are. And then when we roll out our omnibus, um, we can have that discussion. Madam, Madam Chair, if I may. Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Albright, uh, I, I don't know, I didn't probably mention this in the opening, but it, I do believe it should have been in the uh, information you received from um, nonpartisan staff. Uh, these, there, are, uh, there are credits from the federal government uh, for coverage of this for state and local government. So much of that cost will be covered. I mean, it will not be an extra cost. Um, and for the state, uh, I believe most state departments have, state agencies have provided this coverage route so it will not be an extra cost to them because they provided this and for those entities that have already provided these type of benefits this will not be an extra benefit for them they will be covered in an exempt thank you representative frazier representative albright madam, 
Madam Chair, Representative Frazier, while I appreciate uh, the intent here, uh, the reality of the situation is that uh, our hospitals are going broke. Uh, and the reason I say that in confidence is that uh, not only because of COVID and the uh, extreme, you know, extreme measures that they've had to undergo and, and actually undertake in order not only to comply uh, with the federal mandates, but also just out of sheer uh, reality of, of keeping their frontline workers uh, safe as well as their patients. But a lot of patients haven't been coming back uh, for you know those ambulatory uh, surgeries, uh, for the regular screenings for cancer and other these things. So uh, you know we, we've, we've got, I would say, dare say, probably 40 hospitals right now that are operating in a net deficit. If you place this type of a burden on them, I don't you know, notwithstanding credits, uh, and, 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 and I mean no disrespect, uh, but notwithstanding any credits that the federal government might provide to these hospitals, uh, this literally will be the death sentence for a number of our community hospitals if you uh, are successful in placing this into law. Uh, so I would encourage other members to ask the tough questions, but also seek out uh, the, the response from your hospitals and your uh, uh, entities that provide service with essential workers and find out uh, how they would uh, balance their uh, profit and loss statement if this were enacted into law. I would encourage uh, the members uh, to uh, vote no on this proposition. Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Albright. That's, that, that, that comment was a little bit different from your first question, which was about public entity. So I'll, I'll respond to the, the second part. Um, yeah, for, for hospitals, some hospitals have provided these benefits. And again, if they provided them, they're exempt from this. Uh, but what I will say is there have been plenty of healthcare providers that were not provided the benefits. They did have to take time off, quarantine. Um, if they were exposed or if they were actually diagnosed with COVID-19, they had to use PTO, vacation time, sick time. They burnt up all those banks. Then when they were out, they had to work without pay. So they're, they're in debt. Bills are piling up. Some are facing bankruptcy or evictions. I think we have to think about the damage that was done there and the cost that they're paying as well. I understand the bottom lines for hospitals. They're there to serve people and their employers. I mean, their employees have been harmed. Um, I think we have to figure out a way to take care of our essential workers. But thank you for that. Thank you. Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question's for the bill author. Uh, Representative Frazier, I, I know that we're still working on the fiscal note to understand the the public, you know, the cost to the state, um, you know, from your bill. I was wondering, are, are there any estimates that, that you have done to calculate what the cost would be to private sector employers um, uh, for this uh, new mandate. I, I share Representative Albright's concerns, especially uh, for hospitals. I, in the district I represent, we have some small independent hospitals, critical access hospitals that have just been really hit hard this year. And so I was wondering, Representative Frazier, if you have any information on what this will cost you know, the, the private sector, especially those um, small rural critical access hospitals. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Frazier. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Representative Rasmussen, thank you for that question. I do not have those numbers, uh, but what I will state is I, I've seen letters from organizations and I have yet to see them provide those numbers as well. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Frazier, and, and appreciate that those numbers would be difficult to calculate. And uh, when I've been talking with my local hospitals, you know, their their margins are just non-existent this year, given all the factors that um, have already been listed. And so I would, um, you know, ask that that we take a, a closer look at this and really, um, you know, try to tailor a proposal to take into account the the organizations that just won't have the money to actually fund this mandate and that this could be the thing that that puts them under that actually closes these facilities and costs um people jobs here in minnesota and so i'll be um you know unfortunately voting no on the bill today but um appreciate the conversation uh, madam chair and representative frazier madam chair may i yep representative frazier I I'll be quick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be quickly. Uh, Representative Rasmussen, if these if these small critical care sites, which ones that I know, if they are under 500 employees, they they will the credit I speak I uh, spoke about earlier, they will be dollar for dollar reimbursed uh, to provide for this this type of leave. Representative Bonner. 
Thank you. And thank you for that last clarification, actually, Representative Frederick. Frederick. Um, and to really explain some of the fiscal aspects of this. And certainly we're, we're looking forward to seeing the, the final fiscal note on this. Um, and, and I understand and appreciate the, the other members' concern about making sure that we're good stewards for those local assets, particularly in greater Minnesota. Um, but I just wanna kind of center this and, and say, you know, I, I hear firsthand from tons of nurses who, you know, when COVID started, they were ready, willing, and able to step up. They did not hesitate. Many of them worked double shifts. Many of them worked extended hours. Um, and the strain and stress of some of those shifts was tremendous. But they went home every day to their families. Some of them actually quarantining within their own homes to make sure that their families were safe. These are folks who put their, their own or your family above their own in the middle of a pandemic. And they did it with gladly. They did it happily without reservation. And so when we're talking about making sure that we're doing the right thing by these folks, yes, it is wonderful to say thank you. It is wonderful to put up a message on Facebook. But the bottom line is, these folks sacrificed a lot for us to get us through this pandemic. And at some point we need to take up or step up and put our actions in place. Thank you, Vice Chair Bonner. Chair Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative Fraser for carrying this bill, which is obviously uh, kind of complicated and requires, <laughs> I'm sure, a lot of your time. Um, I just raised my hand to sort of comment on the, the concern about hospital finances, which I was just reading the letter from the Minnesota Hospital Association. You know, one thing in all my years I've been in the legislature, I keep finding out how much I don't know about how much all these things work. And I just really want us to, I wanted to just put a spotlight on that fact. I learned this year about the 340B program and how that is uh, channeling really what amounts to subsidies to some but not all of these hospitals. That's a, a stream of funding that I had no idea was happening. And um, you know, in all these years I've been in the legislature and working on healthcare, I really know very little about the actual funding for the various kinds of hospitals that we have in our system. And But what I do know is that some of them have done very well. Now, I do recognize that the ones that are, you know, that there are small hospitals that have a different uh, funding mechanisms. Um, but I just really do want to say that, um, you know, anytime we do anything in this legislature uh, or, or many times, somebody comes forward to say, you know, that will sink me. I, you can't do that. That is a disaster for me. I, you know, no one ever likes to be told that they need to do something they're not doing especially if it costs them money. And so I just want us to be a little bit cautious of just sort of accepting the blanket word of someone when they say, and really try to dig in. I would love to know exactly, you know, what has happened to the various entities during COVID. It is of great concern to all of us. None of us want to sink our hospitals. We want these resources available to Minnesotans in every corner of our state. There is no question we have that shared interest. But part of that makes sure, too, that they have personnel. A hospital is no good without the nurses to be there to support the patients. So, you know, I don't know the, the answer. I'm not here to offer an answer. I just want to say that, you know, the blanket statement that this is going to be terrible and sink our hospitals, I think, is a little overwrought, and we should be careful about that language. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Liebling. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Frazier, for bringing this bill. Um, I just wanted to ask more about this credit that you've been discussing. I've looked at the amendment. I've looked at the bill. I'd like to read how it works, and I don't find it. How can we understand this better? Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Roberts, thank you for that question. It would not be in a bill. It is, it is the credit that the federal government provides that has been extended and has been in place. Uh, it was in place with the initial FFCRA that passed, 
and it has been extended with the American. It was been it was extended once, and it's been extended again with the American Rescue Plan. So it would not be listed in this bill, but those uh, those entities are still eligible based on the federal legislation. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Frazier. And and does it provide full reimbursement? And does that include private employers as well as um, public? Representative Frazier. Absolutely, public. Um, and it, yes, for private as well, if they meet the criteria, if they have 500 employees or less. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, and your bill, um, has no carve out for small employers, but you're saying they would be fully covered for reimbursement under the federal credit for both the 80 retroactive and the 80 hours prospective? Representative Frazier. Representative uh, Robbins, could you, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Robbins, could you repeat the last part? Representative Robbins. Thank you, I'm sorry, yes. So I'm just trying to clarify that small employers with essential workers who are private would get full coverage under the federal credit for all 160 hours? If, if they are, thank you, Madam Chair, sorry. If they are 500 or less, they would get reimbursement for those hours, 500 employees or less. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Representative Frazier. I would love to, if, if someone on the staff or someone could send me an email with the link to understanding this credit and how it works, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Robbins, we can ask those questions today at three o'clock too when we go over the American Recovery Act. Thank you. Okay, Representative Sandell, and then we'll go to um, the testifier and closing comments. Representative Sandell. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I want to support uh, Representative Frazier's uh, bill. But I do, uh, I am worried a little bit about the uh, fiscal note and how much it, uh, how much uh, this would cost. I, uh, I, I'll, uh, I, I don't think we're voting today, are we? I, I don't think we are. Oh, we are voting on this. Uh, We're gonna, we need to vote it out to ways and means. Okay. Well, I I, I will vote it out to uh, I I will support the bill and and, and vote yes, but uh, uh, with some trepidation because it is kind of tough to do this without knowing what it's going to cost. So, uh, good luck with the bill. Thank you, Representative Sandell. Let's see. Is uh, Jessica Joyal with us now? If she would like to testify. Ah, uh, yes, I'm here now. Sorry, I was having trouble with it. Oh, we're glad you can join us. Just state your name and affiliation and then proceed with your testimony. Okay. Um, good morning, Madam Chair um, and committee members. My name is Jessica Joyle. And for the last 10 years, I've worked for the state of Minnesota as a security counselor at the Minnesota Sex Offender Program in Moose Lake. And I'm a member of APSME Local 1092. I'm here testifying in support of the Central Employees Emergency Leave Act which in, ensures all workers who were excluded from coverage under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act will have access to equivalent pay, paid time if they need to be away from work due to COVID. The state's ability to approve COVID leave has varied by program or facility and in certain scenarios, COVID leave was denied when requested for reasons covered under this bill. This is what happened to me. A few, a few months ago, our five-year-old son was sent home from school due to another child in the classroom being exposed to COVID. And given his exposure, he was not allowed to return to school or his child care for two weeks. <clears throat> uh, my husband also works for the state of Minnesota and we were both off duty when we got the call. We were left with no options for alternative care. Our family and friends didn't want to watch him because of his known exposure in the classroom. Um, when I requested to use COVID leave for this reason, I was denied and told that the policy is discretionary for critical service staff and due to staffing shortages. Um, the state was only approving COVID leave for health related reasons and not when a family member is restricted from child care for child in quarantine. And this happened to us multiple times and without any notice. Um, I would not have been allowed to use my vacation approach for this type of reason. And the security staff at MSOP um, usually work six days in a row and many uh, security staff regularly get forced to work late due to staffing shortages. Our jobs are risky and in normal times, risky in normal times and we keep Minnesota safe from dangerous sex offenders. COVID is an added hazard, <laughs> hazardous layer to our work. These essential employees, deserve the same support 
um, as other rece workers received from the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, our program needs to be fully funded to, so staffing shortages do not inhibit our ability to have our leave requests approved. This expenditure is one of many initiatives that could benefit those of us who serve on the front lines of this pandemic and risk our health and well-being in service to Minnesotans. Please recognize that the sacrifices of essential workers and the supporting and that supporting these employees is more than justified. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Joyal, for your testimony. I hope your son is healthy and well and was did not contract the virus. <laughs> great, great <laughs> news. Representative Frazier, closing comments to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just, just to circle back, I mean, this is about essential workers. I, I do understand the concern that folks have raised around how it will impact um, smaller businesses. There, there will be, there is some aid out there through tax credits, um, as I've mentioned. Um, but we really have to think about the impact that it's had on our workers. Um, and I think that members of this committee have stated it pretty well that without those workers, we don't have these businesses in the first place. So let's keep it centered there. And I, I would appreciate supporting this bill. Thank you, Representative Fraser. So I'll renew my motion to re-refer House File 41 as amended to the Ways and Means Committee. This will be a roll call vote. Ms. Hansen, please take the roll call. Chair votes aye. Schultz, aye. Vice Chair Bonner? Aye. Bonner, aye. Lead Albright? No. Oh. No. Representative Bolden? Aye. Representative Burkle? No. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Oh, Burkle, no, Fisher, aye. Representative Frederick? Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Hansen? Aye. Hansen, aye. Keel, excused. Representative Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Moeller? Aye. Moeller, aye. Representative Noor? Yes. Noor, yes. Representative Novotny? Novotny, no. Novotny, no. Representative Pearson? Nah. Pearson, no. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Rasmussen? Rasmussen, no. Representative Rasmussen, no. Representative Robbins? No. Robbins, no. Representative Sandell? Aye. Repre Sandell, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. TGIF members. Um, Chair Schultz, that's 11 ayes, 7 nays, and 1 excused. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. So the motion prevails, and House File 41 as amended will be sent to Ways and Means. Thank you, Representative Frazier, and thank you to our testifier today. Thank you. Okay, all. members, the next bill we have is House File 1532. So I will move that House File 1532 be placed on the general register. Members, we've heard this bill, and we are not going to take any testimony, but we do have um, two amendments, I believe. Representative Frederick, would you like to move your amendments? So moved, Madam Chair. Okay, Representative Frederick moves the A4 amendment. Can you describe the A4 amendment? Representative Frederick, can you describe the A4 amendment briefly? Hope you're muted. Go ahead, Representative Frederick. Oh, we still can't hear you. Can you check your audio down by the mute button? Nope, we can't hear you yet. Oh, I'm sorry. We adopted the A4 amendment. I'm sorry, I made the wrong motion. We need to um, move to reconsider the A4 amendment. So I will move to reconsider the A4 amendment because we have a amendment to the A4 amendment. I can still not hear Representative Frederick. Ms. Punelli, can someone describe um, the A5 amendment? 
Uh, Madam Chair and members, the A5 amendment is an amendment to the A4 amendment to just remove all of the civil commitment language from the A4 amendment. Okay, so this remember, remember House File 1532 is a human services community supports DHS uh, bit policy bill. And so we, I'm, I'm gonna move to reconsider the A4 amendment. This will require a voice vote and then I will um, move to amend it. So first let's do the voice vote to move to reconsider the A4 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the A4 amendment is gonna be reconsidered. Now I'll move to amend the A4 amendment with the A5 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion prevails and the A5 amendment to the A4 amendment prevails, is adopted. Okay, let's check to see if Representative Frederick is available. I'm gonna check your audio one more time. We cannot hear you, sorry, Representative Frederick. Okay, members, since we have, a, have had a description of the A5 amendment, are there any questions for House Research or for um, DHS on the A5 amendment to the A4? Not seeing any questions from members. Okay, so I'm gonna renew my motion to place House File 1532 as amended to be placed on the general register. This will be um, a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Schultz, aye. Vice Chair Bonner. Aye. Bonner, aye. Lead Albright. Aye. Albright, aye. Representative Bolden. Aye. Oh, just wait. Stop, stop, stop. Sorry, I messed it up. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank goodness it is a Friday. So first, I'm sorry, members. I need to move the A, I need to move to amend House File 1532 with the newly amended A4 amendment. My apologies. So this is a voice vote. So the motion is to move to amend House File 1532 with the newly amended A4. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the A4 amended as amended with the A5 is amended to House File 1532. Now I will make renew I will renew my motion to place House File 1532 as amended to be placed on the general register. Chair votes aye. Schultz, aye. Vice Chair Bonner. Bonner, aye. Lead Albright. Aye. Albright, aye. Representative Walden. Aye. Golden Eye, Representative Burkle. Aye. Rep I, thank you, sir. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Frederick. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Keel excused. Representative Liebling. Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Muller, aye. Representative Noor. Aye. Nor aye. Representative Novotny. Novotny aye. Novotny aye. Representative Pearson. Pearson aye. Pearson aye. Thank you. Representative Pinto. Aye. Pinto aye. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen aye. Rasmussen aye. Representative Robbins. No. Robbins no. Representative Sandell. Aye. Sandell aye. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher aye. Schumacher, aye. Chair Schultz with. Madam Chair. Representative Albright. Madam Chair, uh, this is more a point of parliamentary inquiry, but as I track those amendments, um, could someone just verify? I'm, I'm just wondering if we, you amended the A4 onto the A5, but did we um, did we then take a vote to adopt the A5 as amended onto the bill? We did. We did. It was a voice vote. Okay. All right. Just I'm just trying to track so that. Uh, I'm sorry. This I'm was this was <laughs> yeah, confusing. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm in a truck, so I'm I'm getting uh, bits and pieces. So I just wanted to make sure that that we okay. that we don't have to go. Uh, 
back back uh, in another uh, committee hearing and redo this if we so can just I will track it let correctly. me just go through and remind members we moved to reconsider the A4 amendment we moved to amend the A4 amendment with the A5 and then we moved to amend the bill with the newly amended A4 so we took those vo as voice votes and then we did a roll call yes and the results of the roll call chair Schultz it's 16 eyes one nay two excused we did it, members. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hansen. So with that, members, the motion prevails and House File 1532 as amended will be sent to the General Register. Ms. Representative Robbins, sorry, I didn't see your hand. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I know this was confusing. I was confused. That's why I voted no, because I wasn't exactly sure what we were doing <laughs> and I didn't want to vote on something I wasn't clear on. Um, but my understanding of the A was that it addresses um, uh, data privacy. And so I'm wondering that that section is new and hasn't been heard by judiciary. So why isn't this going back to judiciary? Let's see. I'm gonna call on uh, Ms. Grom. Uh, Madam Chair, Christy Graham with the Department of Human Services. Um, Representative, that's a good question. This bill was heard before the Judiciary Committee, including these provisions. Um, and it's my understanding this amendment was actually adopted in this committee when this was heard and laid over. Um, so we have we have vetted this amendment um, pretty thoroughly already. Happy Thank to answer you. any questions. Th Thank you, call. Ms. Graham. That's my understanding, too, that it has been through Judiciary. Representative Robbins? Okay, I, I don't recall that part in judiciary, but we've seen a lot of bills over there too, so maybe I'm just misunderstanding. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Representative Robbins. Okay, members, the next bill that we have is House File 1340. And members, we've heard this bill already. We're bringing it back to send to the General Register and we're going to be amending it. Representative Nor, would you like to move House File 1340 to be placed on the General Register? Yes, please, Madam Chair. Representative Nor moves that House File 1340 be placed on the General Register. Also, you, would you like to move your A3 amendment? Yes, I move A3 amendment, okay, Madam Representative Chair. Nor moves his A3 amendment. Can you briefly describe that for us, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The amendment creates a foster care rate for foster residence setting that are currently considered to be foster family foster care in Minnesota, but under the FFPSA uh, will become part of the congregate care category of foster care providers that will be the basic uh, foster care rate in the um, in the not not start care for children. Uh, Madam Chair, the amendment also requires county social service agency to consult with parents and a child age 14 and older when creating the child's family and permanency team under Chapter 260D if a parent or child raises concern about a relative or professional, the county should not include them in the team when they're, when they're making those exceptions, uh, with exceptions noted in the amendment. The amendment also requires county social service agency to consult with parents and a child age 14 and older when performing a relative search under chapter 260 D. If the parent or child raises concern about a relative or professional, the county should not include them on the team with the exceptions also noted in the amendment. Uh, the amendment also provides certification requirement for facilities to provide supervised independent living settings for youth age 18 or older. It also requires DHS to consult with stakeholders and develop aftercare policies for children living QRTPs. Uh, and also the amendment adds language ensuring initiative tribes have the same right as counties to enter into local agency contract for, purpose, for purposes of delivering child welfare services. Madam Chair and members, you do have a package of how that uh, amendment interacts with the bill. This came out of the stakeholders uh, conversation and I ask for your support. Thank you, Representative Nora. So as I recall, we had uh, opposition to this bill when we heard it in testimony and those stakeholders um, got together and 
tried to address those concerns with this amendment. Are there questions to the amendment, Representative Albright? Madam Chair and, and Representative Knorr, thank you for uh, reaching out to the stakeholders. Just a question, but uh, has this uh, or is there a, a need for this uh, amendment to have been heard or has the language itself been heard in judiciary? Uh, uh, I, I don't want to postpone, uh, you know, the issue, but the process is everything paramount to, you know, vetting it properly. Just wondering if you've uh, con consulted with the judiciary on this uh, amendment. Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Albright, yes, we had this bill uh, in judiciary and we covered all uh, the segments and anything that was going to be added. Uh, I think uh, we had the conversation with stakeholders to ensure that this bill is ready to go to the floor and to be voted uh, uh, because it's, a, it's an agency bill uh, as is and also uh, by the requirement under the Federal Family Fast Pre Prevention Services Act which is going to be effective October uh, this this year. So we want to make sure that we're ready for that. Representative Albright. I just, just want to be clear that we're amending this bill in uh, this committee, but yet the uh, language was vetted in some other form in judiciary um, as, it, as it has been written in the amendment. It's, I just paraphrasing, but just want to be clear in terms of what I heard. Thank you, Representative Albright. We're having trouble hearing you, but Representative Noor, I hope you could hear that because I was not able to. Uh, yes, I did. And so the, the section for the amendment comes from the stakeholders' uh, conversation to ensure that the changes that they requested that to be added is added in the language. And this bill, uh, as, as we put forward, uh, I think... Uh, we have been through the uh, judiciary to explain uh, the segments that were impacting uh, judiciary. There are minor changes uh, to, to the bill when it comes to the judiciary section uh, with the amendment. And I'm hopeful that uh, we, we can always uh, understand when a bill goes from one place to the other and then there's some suggested language that needs to be added uh, that we can uh, adapt because it's coming from the stakeholders. Thank you, Representative Noor. So let's see, I'm not seeing any more questions. Members, we're gonna vote on the, um, the motion to um, move the A3 amendment to House File 1340. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. The motion prevails and the A3 amendment is adopted. So Representative Noor, we have some testifiers and we'll go to the testifiers. We have, um, the first testifier is Brad Vold. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Schultz and members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Brad Vold and I'm the Director of Public Health and Social Services in Morrison County. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators, or MAXA, regarding the Families First Prevention Services Act provisions in House File 1340. I'd like to acknowledge that counties have been before this committee on this issue and are committed to working with legislator, legislators, Department of Human Services and stakeholders to address ongoing implementation concerns. Counties recognize that FFPSA will require significant changes to our child welfare system with inherent complexities and nuances in the legislation. Max has been working with stakeholders and the Department of Human Services throughout the planning process. The two areas I'd like to bring the committee's attention to are first, County support of the family's first requirements being applied to 260D placements. This recommendation is noted in the January legislative report from the work group that Max has participated in alongside DHS, NAMI, and other stakeholders. The second part is the family's first causes a change in the designation for children's corporate foster care facilities, resulting in the Minnesota Assessment of Parenting for Children and Youth no longer determining that room and board rates for these facilities come October of 2021. In effect, this would result in counties having to negotiate a room and board rate with each of the more than 150 plus programs across the state. Having counties engage in contract negotiations on room and board rate location by location could create new inconsistencies in those rates and add administrative burden. MAXA supports establishing a statewide rate for these settings 
tying it to the MAPC basic rate already in statute that adjusts based on federal costs. This uniform basic monthly rate continues current practice is simple, consistent, and fair across the state. Thank you again for the opportunity to share the perspective of County Human Services. In our state supervised county administered human services system, our county staff are responsible for locally navigating the federal changes that are brought about because of the passage of the Families First Prevention Services Act. MAXA remains committed to working with stakeholders to implement FFPSA. Again, thank you and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Vold. We'll hold off on questions until we get through all the testifiers. The next testifier is Kirsten Anderson from Aspire, Minnesota. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and continue with your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kirsten Anderson. I'm Executive Director of Aspire, Minnesota, a statewide association of children's service providers. We are grateful for the ongoing work of DHS, counties and NAMI Minnesota on the Family First Prevention Services Act and the language before you. Aspire Minnesota agrees that this is critical to pass this year to assure federal compliance for the state of Minnesota. The amendment you adopted includes several important technical and content improvements to the bill. Three areas to highlight for you are direction to the commissioner to develop meaningful aftercare support. Aftercare is a deeply meaningful and <laughs> deeply needed area of service that has been missing from our service continuum. Once substantially developed, aftercare will make a significant difference in supporting children to transition home after residential treatment with the help needed to stay safe, engaged, and well while reintegrating fully into family and community life. Including all four federal, federally allowed exceptions to QRTP, um, including support for independent living for youth who are transitioning to adulthood, and honoring family and youth direction and who is included in the relative search and related permanency team to support youth and families through the treatment and transition process. This has been a priority led by NAMI Minnesota and Sue Aberholden wanted me to convey uh, that she extends the gratitude from NAMI to all who've been working in this process and supports the amendment and the work completed to date. Several issues do remain under discussion and we believe can yet be, be resolved. We look forward to continuing work with DHS, MAXA, and NAMI. Uh, three key issues uh, are, first, the settings for children who are served in family foster care licensed corporate foster care settings. Children with disabilities are served in this unique setting that will be impacted by family first changes. We look forward to delving more deeply into this policy area to assure children in these settings will continue to access needed care. Second and related, as a matter of public policy, we believe it's important to identify costs required to meet the federal process and standards required for the state, county, and providers. It is important to assess and identify how these new costs will impact our system so we can ultimately clarify how these costs should be paid for within state, county, and county government and for service providers. And finally, the third path, a topic of great value to all of us led by Representative Hansen and Nominee Minnesota with House File 944. Um, this represents a true system reform to create a path for families in need of residential treatments for a mentally ill child by creating a quote third path or a mental health care path for families instead of requiring that families access care through our child welfare system. We believe when we arrive at the technical solution that clearly works for all, this will move our system forward to respond to children with mental illness with a path to needed treatment that reflects the values and practices of a required healthcare response, honoring the child and family with a more direct path to the mental health treatment they need that reflects the system we want to create for the future. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. So members, we also have Matt Freeman here from MAXA. So if members have questions, please raise your hand if you have questions for the testifiers or for Mr. Freeman. I'm not seeing any questions. Representative Noor, closing comments? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I think uh, uh, we have to do uh, what is right to ensure that our programs uh, are aligned with the requirement under the FF. PSA, and I look forward to uh, you know taking this bill to the floor and uh, getting it to the Senate so we can uh, finalize this requirement. So thank you so much, and I ask for your support. Thank you, Representative Noor, and to our testifiers. So with that, Representative Noor renews his motion to place House File 1340 
as amended on the general register. This will be a roll call. Ms. Hansen, chair votes aye. Schultz, aye. Vice Chair Bonner. Aye. Bonner, aye. Lead Albright. Aye. Thank you. Albright, aye. Representative Bolden. Aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Burkle. Aye. Burkle, aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Keel. Aye. Keel, aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Muller, aye. Representative Noor. Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Novotny. Novotny, aye. Novotny, aye. Representative Pearson. Pearson, aye. Pearson, aye. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Rasmussen? Rasmussen, aye. Rasmussen, aye. Representative Robbins? Aye. Robbins, aye. Representative Sandell? Aye. Sandell, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Thank you, members. It's 19 ayes and zero nays, Chair Schultz. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. The motion prevails and House File 1340 as amended will be placed on the general register. Thank you, Representative Knorr. The next bill we have for consideration is House File 2153. So I'll move it so it's before the committee and House File 2153 will be laid over for possible inclusion in our human services finance bill. Representative Moeller, I don't have amendments. So to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Hopefully this will be pretty straightforward. So House File 2153 is a bill that continues to address the growing need for independent living facilities for those with disabilities. Last year with the bipartisan help and support from Chair Schultz, along with Senator Abler in the Senate, the previous elderly waiver grant program was changed to the Customized Living Quality Improvement Grant Program. And this new grant program has been expanded to include BI and CADI waivers to provide more access to individuals in need of assisted living facilities. CADI and BI facilities will be able to access funds from this grant program for the first time this year, which is why it is vital to fund this program adequately. With a larger pool of applicants, more money is needed to continue the success we've seen in providing living services to Minnesotans who need it the most saving the state money by avoiding nursing home costs. House file 2153 appropriates 2 million over the next two years to make sure that providers can continue to provide alternative higher quality of life options for residents within the independent living community. Um, members, there is a handout in your packet and also I have one testifier, Madam Chair, Lori, Lorianne Granados from Accessible Space. Thank you, Representative Muller. So to the testifier, Lorianne Granados, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and then proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee and thank you, Representative Moeller, for your support. <laughs> My name is Lorianne Sarfolian Granados. I am the Director of Human Resources for Accessible Space Incorporated, ASI. ASI is a Minnesota nonprofit founded in 1978 to meet the needs of a friend who had broken his neck and found out there were no independent living facilities for adults with disabilities. And so he moved into a nursing home until there were. Today, we provide customized living services in apartment settings for more than 100 Minnesotan adults with significant physical disabilities from Rochester to Duluth. We provide extensive physical cares and medication assistance 24 seven. That 24 hour access to care allows our clients to live in the community with dignity and self-determination at a fraction of the cost of nursing home placement. The problem is we only serve low-income residents. 98% of our service residents are Medicaid recipients and their care is funded through the CADI and brain injury waivers. This disproportionate percentage of waiver clients creates a tremendous financial burden for us. As you may know, the waiver rates are quite low compared to the cost of care. The rates are nowhere near proportional to the rates paid for DD services, but more importantly, the waiver rates don't reflect the level of care or the degree of staffing needed for the clients we serve. The rates in 2019 resulted in a $450,000 deficit in this fund for us. And that was after a $320,000 deficit in 2018. 
but the waiver rates haven't increased for more than seven years. So we're really trying to pay 2021's expenses with 2013 budgets. Since we don't serve any private pay or insurance clients, there is no other group to shift these unreimbursed costs to. That has made it really difficult for us to continue these critical services. In fact, the only way that we continue to provide these services is to subsidize this fund with revenue from other services in other states. Absent ASI services, most of our service residents would reside for years for the rest of their lives in a nursing home at a much higher cost and at a significantly diminished quality of life. ASI services present, prevent nursing home admission, which benefits the individual, their families, and the Minnesota taxpayers. We have so many vital involved active residents who have complex 24-hour needs that simply could not live and thrive in another setting. But customized living allows them to access 24-hour care that they need with the freedom and independence of their own apartment. We have a resident in Duluth who has quadriplegia and is on a vent, and he lives in his own apartment, attends classes at UMD virtually, watches gopher games with his girlfriend in his apartment. I just cannot imagine him living in a nursing home. Last year, with the help and support of Senators Abler and Hoffman in the Senate and Senator and Representative Schultz in the House, <laughs> this elderly waiver grant program was changed to become the Customized Living Quality Improvement Grant, and that allows expanded eligibility to brain injury and caddy providers who serve disproportionate uh, populations of waiver recipients. Caddy and brain injury providers will be able to access these funds in the grant program for the first time, which is why it's so vital to fund this program. It will really make significant impact in the lives of our clients by filling a funding gap that will allow us to secure the staff so critical to, this, to serving the residents and realizing our mission until we can rectify the problem with the waiver rates. I thank you so much for working together with us to resolve this issue so that we can continue to provide services in Minnesota. And with that, Madam Chair, I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Granados. Do we have questions from members to the bill author or to the testifier? I'm not seeing questions. Representative Muller, closing comments? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to Ms. Granados for, for your testimony and for the work you do. And thank you, Chair Schultz, for hearing this bill and to the members. I appreciate your support. Thank you, Representative Muller. So with that, members, House File 2153 will be laid over for possible inclusion in our Human Services Finance Bill. Okay, members, we're almost finished. The last bill on our agenda is House File 1159. As you recall, we've heard this bill earlier this session. We do have an amendment. So I'll move to re-refer House File 1159 to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Representative Aikum, welcome back. Can you describe your DE1 amendment, please? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. Um, so it's um, what we're doing is changing the effective date. Um, previously, it was um, set to be um, retroactive, which we can't do. So it's setting an, an effective date that will um, follow final passage or upon federal approval, um, which you may remember is part of the um, CFSS program. And so um, whichever is, is um, later. And then also it's um, adding some appropriations language um, that was not there before. And so um, has a, a small 2021 um, appropriation and a $300,000 2022 appropriation. Thank you, Representative Akem. So members recall, this is the bill that um, allows us to compensate personal care attendants who are spouses or parents. And it's urgent because we have a shortage of PCAs and we also are dealing with the pandemic. So we have put appropriation on as Representative Acom says, and I will move the DE1 amendment and then we will go to questions um, on the bill as amended. So members, all those in favor of adopting the DE1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the DE1 amendment is adopted to House File 1159. Representative Acom, any other comments to the bill as amended? 
Not really. Um, as you said, we've already um, had this bill, um, the content before you, and I, it, it is urgent for the reasons Chair Schultz mentioned. And um, while this was a, initially a, um, a provision that was put in through the peacetime emergency, emergency, it has expired on February 7th. And so there are families that are um, struggling now because they can no longer utilize this service and it's challenging to find PCAs to bring into their home to care for their loved ones. So there is an urgency in this. So thank you for considering it. Thank you. Any questions from members? I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you, Representative Acom. So I'm gonna renew my motion to re-refer House File 1159 as amended to Ways and Means. This will be a roll call vote. Ms. Hansen, Chair votes aye. Schultz, aye. Vice Chair Bonner. Aye. Bonner, aye. Lead Albright. Aye. Albright, aye. Thank you. Representative Bolden. Aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Burkle. No. Burkle, no. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Keel. No. Keel, no. Representative Liebling. Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Muller, aye. Representative Noor. Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Novotny. Repre Representative Pearson? No. Pearson, no. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Rasmussen? Rasmussen, no. Rasmussen, no. Representative Robbins? Aye. Robbins, aye. Representative Sandell? Aye. Sandell, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Novotny, did you want to place a vote? Uh, I'm sorry, I lost track with the public safety, so I'll have to pass. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. One second. Chair Schultz, that's 13 ayes, five nays, and one excused. Thank you members so much for your patience today. Thank you, Ms. Hanson, we appreciate this. So the motion um, prevails and House File 1159 as amended will be going to ways and means. Thank you members. So this is just a reminder. I appreciate everyone's succinct questions and deliberations today. Um, we'll adjourn today and then we will meet again for an informational joint hearing with Health Finance today at three o'clock to go over the American Recovery Act funds and the funds that are specific to HHS and any guidance that we've received as a state um, on how those funds may be spent and used. So with that, members, we are adjourned. Thank you.